Thank you. This has been a very intense week. Uh, for many of you, it's been two weeks. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I wanted to uh, say that um, a lot of, we've had lots of discussions and our discussions go in all sorts of directions and I wanted to make sure that um, a, even though we wanted to keep um, the idea of translation flexible and there's no way you can uh, prevent it from it uh, becoming metaphorical, I, I, I wanted to make sure that we uh, Develop, develop some rigorous thinking about the concept. Um, last time, uh, well, in my last two lectures, I tried to um, go over some of the uh, familiar uh, terrains in communication study, uh, in translation studies, including uh, the model of communication and what people do with semantics and the limits of, uh, of that direction. That is, we wanted to go to semantics um, and worry about linguistic commensurability or incommensurability. And so uh, I also, uh, in my le first lecture, uh, tried to uh, really uh, take a hard look at the logic of equivalence that lies behind a lot of our work. Uh, when we posit translatability or untranslatability. Um, and, and I wanted to suggest, just suggest ways of thinking or pushing against uh, some of these familiar concepts. Um, I did so in my last two lectures uh, by interrogating the limits of translation as a very concept, if you recall. The first lecture focused on the place of number in language, which then led us to uh, some reflections on the relation between sense and nonsense uh, and the paranoia that translators attach to the haunting presence of nonsense, right? So we worry about that a lot, you know, really sweat it out, you know, am I getting it right? You know, keeping nonsense at bay. So that is a problem for me. And then in my last lecture, I talked about scripts uh, as another way of interrogating the limits of our thinking about translation. Um, and often we don't, we leave scripts unthought um, in our work, theoretical work on translation as we worry about what's translatable, what is not translatable, all right? so. Today, guess where I'm taking the conversation. <laughs> okay, so today I wanted to say, uh, ask can the eventfulness of translation itself be thought? Now, I recently published uh, uh, an article carrying this concept, the, the eventfulness of translation in the journal, translation, a uh, transdisciplinary journal, S Siri, uh, just brought copies for us, and I got my copy uh, of the following issue. Um, it appeared in number four. Uh, but I gave uh, uh, a different set of uh, historical examples to illustrate uh, the ways in which we might be able to grapple with the eventfulness of translation. Um, I propose this in order to think about methods, develop methods to analyze the politics of translation. And in the, my previous lectures, I promised to go into the problem of politics of translation. But it's how do we even go about analyzing the politics of translation without simply taking some contents into uh, our, you know, as an object of analysis. Uh, even the very object of analysis needs to be rethought. How do we, you know, be, you know, this is the whole point of developing a method. So the question is how to analyze the politics of translation. Where do we look for the politics translation? Is it uh, readily legible um, in our uh, work, of, uh, work of translation? 
either as in a theoretical uh, project or in practice. Now, I wanted to quickly uh, go over some possible directions and uh, 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 directions we could push this analysis. One is the geopolitics of language, and I want to add in recent history, and this is the emphasis of my essay in number, uh, in, in, in number four of uh, translation, journal, okay. And then I think Michael uh, yesterday brought up uh, the, the question of the ecology of translation. And then, uh, so I wanted to emphasize in solidarity with this kind of approach, instead of taking a linguistic analysis of translation, we take it in some larger uh, 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 realms. And um, my focus today is on the geopolitics of language in recent history. And Van's work, I assigned uh, uh, a chapter from his new book, uh, Motherless Tongues, for our discussion, I think it was last week, uh, hoping that you will have read um, his most recent engagement with this problem in relation to the domination of English and American empire. Um, so, uh, uh, and then um, I wanted also to focus on the temporalities of discourse. And um, this is also addressed um, by my essay. It will uh, also appear in today's analysis, which will take on a different subject. Um, and I wanted to emphasize, if we talk about discourse, make sure we talk about discursive practice as translingual practices. What do I mean by that? Um, if we go, if you have read Foucault, if you have read uh, structuralism and post-structuralism, you know the implicit assumption in these uh, studies is that French is the discursive field where you conduct your discursive analysis, or a monolingual social linguistic uh, 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 space would be the focus of discursive analysis. I wanted to open it up to heterolingual spaces where we can consider uh, and analyze discursive practices in those terms. So therefore, um, in today's lecture, I'm going to focus on the making of heterolingual super science. Don't worry, this is a, this is a jargon that I invented <laughs> in, in my book, the, the, the Clash of Empires. It's not that I, I in, enjoy inventing jargons. It's just because I wanted us to uh, step away from our usual fetishization of words. So, <laughs> so don't be offended if I say, do not fetishize words. Uh, how can you do that in your translation studies? Don't we do that all the time? Is there a way of getting around uh, reified words as sort of the, the ontological, uh, ontologically stable unit of analysis? Okay, so that's the issue. So now, just take it <laughs> um, on, um, uh, take it as sort of a initial uh, uh, invitation. Uh, injunction <laughs> or invitation not to fetishize words in our thinking about uh, translation. Um, how is that possible? Okay, so let, let's get to some of those uh, scenarios. So we don't start with words. We start with scenes, like scenarios of first encounters and the rise of modern semiotics. And I think a certain semiotic uh, sensibility would probably help in, in thinking about uh, the ground of translate. How do we theorize translation? And it just happens that uh, a Charles Sanders Peirce, American semiotician, inaugurated his semiotic project in the 19th century by imagining a first encounter. Okay, um, this is not the project that uh, Saussure shared. Saussure started something else, semiology, semiology, uh, whereas uh, Peirce inaugurated uh, semiotics, which was a very different project. So I'm going to uh, 
uh, uh, say a few words about Peirce and it, his relevance to uh, our study of the politics of translation, although it was not his project. Um, this is from one of his uh, seminal essays. Imagine two men who know no common speech, thrown together, remote from the rest of the race. They must communicate, but how are they to do so? Isn't it the initial uh, situation that, uh, you know, it, it looks like, like an, a, a very innocent uh, theoretical proposition. So take it as a proposition, because he didn't have any specific historical uh, situation in mind. He was simply making theory. So this is the, where he started. Okay. So how do people communicate? So his concern was, you know, two strangers coming together, thrown together, pay attention. This is how he interprets the English term symbol. Uh, 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 does anyone know Greek in this room? Okay, so uh, the, the, the English uh, word symbol comes from the Greek root. Right. So what together. thrown together? Okay, great. So this is a, an ideal audience, <laughs> so I don't have to explain, right? Thrown together. So um, thrown together actually is his. Uh, this is not just a English word. It comes to uh, uh, with that whole um, uh, idea of uh, thinking through symbols, right? symbolic practices, especially going back to the Greek roots. It's his exercise. I don't usually do etymological exercises. As you know, I keep my distance. But I thought his exercise is quite interesting, uh, thinking about this initial moment of encounter in terms of symbol, but then, which means thrown together in Greek. And then he further, he, he uh, uh, through this question and initial scenario, he develops three types of icon, uh, three types of uh, signs. Okay, semiotics is a theory of signs, right? S I G N. Okay, so he classifies these three different kinds of symbol uh, signs. So the first is icon, the second index, the third is symbol. Okay. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, you, you can read his essay. I, I, I wanted to take you back to this uh, foundational text because it, it's relevant to our study of the politics of translation. And he answers his own question. How are they to communicate? By imitative sounds, by imitative gestures, and by pictures. These are the three kinds of likenesses. It's true that they will also use other signs, finger pointings and the like, but above, uh, after all, the likenesses will be the only means of describing the qualities of the things and actions which they have in mind. So essentially, he's telling us that for strangers who do not share each other's languages, they communicate in terms of icon. Okay, the first sign, the first type of sign. All right, is that true? Okay, so let's take a look at, this is in his uh, collected papers, the uh, multi-volume, it's in volume two, uh, uh, The Nature of the Sign, I believe that's the essay. Um, all right, I wanted to uh, highlight in this, even though his idea was to go to pictographs, the icon. That's how people communicate. If you don't know each other, like in, in, in the cafeteria, in the hotel, I, I know no Italian, so I communicate by gestures or nonsense sounds, but somehow we make each other understood, all right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I do a lot of pointing. I want this, I want that, all right? Uh, but a, a purse seems to think that it's really a, by giving pictures, right? But um, I wanted us to think about index, the, the second class of symbols called index, finger pointings. 
um, he was suggesting that possibility, right? Um, so let's look more closely at the indexical sign. Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to develop, uh, wanted to remind you of is that structural linguistics in the mid 20th century developed this concept of indexicality quite extensively, although people don't normally pay attention to this. This is my obsession. That is, uh, from a semiotic point of view, has there been any development since uh, Peirce's first proposition of these types of tentative proposition. He was very tentative. He was paying attention to, for instance, the invention of phot photography. And he was having a hard time trying to place photography either within the icon or within in in index. And he was ambivalent about that. He says, OK, a photograph, you take an image of something, it must be icon. However, the chemical process which, we, which allows the, the play to react to the sunlight he says that's indexicality. So he, he wasn't sure what to do with that. So it's quite interesting. But since then, has there been any development? This is my obsession. And I think there's substantial development, not through Saussure, but through another French linguist who truly, truly uh, made an impact on structuralism and so-called post-structuralism, which was an American invention. The French simply. Uh, uh, call them structuralists, right? In structural linguistics, a deictic situation arises when two or more interlocutors engage in a reciprocal exchange of the pronominal I as each addresses or hails the other as you. I mean, this is not a grammatical analysis of pronouns. Um, this is a discursive situation uh, in uh, uh, in a communication uh, process that is presented as a scene of communication, a scenario by a extremely important French structural linguist uh, whose name is Emile Benveniste, who conceptualizes the deixes of pronominal forms as a mode of address in discourse. I can't emphasize as more his contribution um, he, uh, uh, if you look at how Foucault discusses discourse in the archaeology of knowledge, I don't think you would be able to understand what Foucault is doing without having read Benveniste. And all of the so-called post-structuralist thinkers, Derrida, uh, Hollenbach, later Hollenbach, uh, you name them. They all had to respond somehow to Benveniste. They were not responding directly to Saussure. Okay, so this is an extremely important point. I think we have been misled by a lot of the so-called theories, theories of um, uh, a literary theory uh, um, textbooks. Uh, I was misled when I was a graduate student many years ago that okay, post-structuralists derived from uh, uh, Saussure's uh, structural linguistics. That's not true. Uh, the discourse, discourse analysis uh, was developed by Emile Benveniste, an extraordinary scholar. Uh, so uh, his main contribution was to conceptualize the ixis as a mode of address in discourse. Not a grammatical analysis, but a mode of address. Uh, so what is a mode of address? This is extremely important. Those of you who are not familiar, I really recommend his work. A position of enunciation, elocution, across language. Well, uh, across languages is what I added. Um, Emile Benveniste was a polyglot. He knew many languages. But his, most of his theory, theoretical discussion was focused on French. Um, of course, he was speaking to the French speakers uh, and readers. Positions of enunciation, I, I think Judith Butler's interpretation of Foucault was mi misguided because she did not know uh, Benveniste's uh, shadows behind uh, Foucault. 
and she thought it was a performative uh, act, and she she confused this with uh, uh, Austin's uh, theory of a performance. In, in fact, Foucault had nothing to say about had only bad things to say about Austin. Uh, he I, there was only one side remark about Austin's uh, performance, which was poorly developed. It had you know, it had some, you know, interesting uh, moments, but the most systematic development of the position and enunciation discourse was developed by Benedict. Okay. And uh, um, he developed a deictic mode of address as a concept central to the production of subjectivity. And if you look at Foucault's discussion, it's all references to Benedict. Why is that important? Okay. Uh, so this is the book, Problems in Central Linguistics. Um, why is that important for all post-structural linguists there? Um, uh, okay, here, this is a very one uh, uh, phrased uh, a statement. Importance of their function that deictic markers, I, you, in discourse, will be measured by the nature of the problem they serve to solve, which is none other than that of intrasubjective communication, which was the central concern of structural linguists at that time. Language has solved this problem by creating an ensemble of empty signs that are non-referential with respect to reality. Uh, these signs are always available and become full as soon as the speaker introduces them into each instance of this, his discourse. Since they, like pronouns, lack material references, they cannot be misused. Since they do not assert anything, that is, the ground of truth is not uh, applicable to this. Anyone can occupy the position of I. As soon as you open your mouth, I. As soon as uh, you open your mouth, you say I, and I become you. This is, this is, uh, this is the, uh, a deictic relationship made available by these empty signs in all languages, all right? Since they lack material reference, they cannot be misused. They can only be misused if I were to say you, referring to the position of enunciation, right? It's not possible to misuse the pronoun that way. There's nothing to do, it has nothing to do with, uh, with reference, whether, uh, I refers to a true I or a false I. You see? It's deixis. Um, they are not subject to the condition of truth and escape all denial. Their role is to provide the instrument of a conversion. Finally, I refer to our central subject. <laughs> this is what I'm getting at. Conversion that one could call the conversion of language into discourse. All right. So, Structural linguistics is not about grammatical uh, analysis. I mean, the most creative, innovative contribution of structural linguistics of the 20th century is discourse analysis. And the rise of subjectivity in discourse is key. And Lacan uh, also had, was compelled to respond to um, Benveniste's discourse analysis. So was Foucault, so was Derrida, so was everybody. So, but then again, their role is to provide the instrument of a conversion that one could call the conversion of language into discourse. It is by identifying himself as a unique person, pronouncing I, that each speaker sets himself in turn as the subject. So this is what uh, subject means in structural and post-structural uh, analysis of discourse. So we're not we're within the realm of discourse, not in the realm of uh, grammar, uh, 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 even though pronouns are identified by grammarians as a class of uh, uh, parts of speech, right? No, um, Benvenis is taking it in very uh, interesting direction there. So here's uh, my reflection on intersubject communication is the compulsory condition under which the deictic construction of subjectivity takes a place among the speakers of a language. You usually assume there's a homogeneous community uh, of speakers who share the same language. And that, I don't think um, Benveniste uh, had an opportunity to address the, the problem of uh, heterolingual situations where people can engage in dis discursive 
uh, practices without sharing uh, a language. So it's up to people who are interested in translation to develop this further. So that's my interest. Another point. The ground of reciprocity in deixis allows the production of difference through the deict exchange of person or personal pronouns, as well as the simultaneous leveling of that difference with respect to recipro reciprocal address. Address strictly meaning uh, a situation of speech that implies two speakers at least, a relationality, all right? So there's a ground of reciprocity there. I have some issues with uh, Benveni's conception of intersubjective communication and reciprocity. I, I'm going to raise that. Uh, Benveni's concept de exis escapes the condition of truth and denial, and along with them, the potential risks attending the circumstance of intersubjectivity. Um, uh, risks, uh, I'm going to um, illustrate the risk later. This instrumental understanding of subjectivity, I think discourse analysis has this inherent, inherent difficulty uh, of conceptualizing language as communication, and there's always the implied instrumentality there. You know, what, was, what is the tool with which we can communicate, right? There is an instrumental view of language this instrumental understanding of subjectivity, whose partial truth is often reiterated by post-colonial scholarship, post-structuralist scholarship, which is my critique of post-structuralism, disavows the terror of inter intersubjectivity or the possibility of raising an issue about a mode of deictive address that may produce the relations of sovereign rule as much as it produces reciprocity of subjectivity. I'm going to give you an example. This might be a little dense, uh, um, uh, but I, uh, I'll give you a picture first, okay? And this is, you can have a semiotic analysis of this picture. Um, I tend not to encourage students to use pictures as illustrations. They are semiotic uh, objects. We really need to analyze them. See, this picture you see, this comes from a, an 18, uh, f 15 edition of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side is Robinson, and he has his foot, left foot on the head of uh, uh, a savage, whom we can identify as Friday. Okay, this was an inauguration of first encounter that uh, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce would have been familiar with. First encounter, okay. Even though this is a picture, it doesn't play into. <laughs> this is a picture in that novel, in, in that edition, 1815 edition. Okay, so if we were to give a semiotic reading of this, uh, what would it have been? I mean, it, it would have been a very interesting. Benveni's model of communication, like Peirce's semiotics before him, occults the terror to which the speaker of a, a speakers of a language, uh, like, for example, the French-speaking uh, uh, intellectual Franz Fanon, could be exposing themselves uh, in a given semiotic or discursive situation. A visual discursive situation like this in the first encounter. Um, so, but uh, Defoe uh, is right, quite candid about the situation. He doesn't hide anything, or he doesn't occult anything that exclude this, the terror of communication, so-called communication, or what um, Benveniste would, would have called intersubjectivity, right? There, there is no reciprocity except a terror, terrorized Friday, right? So let's see. Um, there's also a narrative description of the, a very interesting situation here, default. So to let Friday understand a little what I would do, I called him to me again, pointing, pointed at the fowl, which was indeed a parrot, misrecognition, though I thought it had been a hawk. I say pointing to the parrot and to my gun, 
and to the ground under the para to let him see I would make it fall. I made him understand that I would shoot and kill that bird. According, I fired and bade him look. In- immediately he saw the para fall and stood like a one frightened again, notwithstanding all I had said to him. And I found he was the more amazed. Because he did not see me put anything into the gun, magic, right? But thought there must be some wonderful fund of death and destruction in that thing, able to kill man, beast, bird, or anything near or far off. And the astonishment this created in him was such that could not wear off for a long time. And I believe if I would have let him, he would have worshipped me and my gun. As for the gun itself. He would not so much as touch it for several days after, but would speak to it, talk to it as if it had answered him. And when he was by himself, which, as I after learned of him, was to desire it not to kill him. So, in this initial、uh, moment of encounter, as imagined by Daniel Defoe, the sign,、uh, the in initial, the inaugural scene of encounter was enabled through not. Not iconic, at least it's not merely iconic, by, but something else.、Uh, that is the staging of first encounter that designates Crusoe's gun as a sign of indexicality, indexicality, and terror. Pointing, you see, pointing finger, pointing gun, pointing right. So what does that do?、Uh, to point. And kill vicariously the gun sign coerces the barbarian's recognition of superior force through a silent mode of address. Again, we have a mode of address. Okay, you could substitute the well first person pronoun, second person pronoun, because they don't speak each other's language, don't share a linguistic、uh, community there. So then, what do they do? It's indexicality and the icon of the sun,、uh, of the gun. This deictic relation of power reiterates the situation of subjugation in the British imagining of their first encounter with the barbarian race, and that was such a、uh, powerful moment.、Uh, the introduction of、uh, of the stranger into Robinson Crusoe's island, right? And so it also illustrates extremely well what Peirce was trying to do, but then didn't completely succeed. In doing, right? So then uh, uh, we can then. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to s- give you this quote because Michel de Sourdo is such a is such a wonderful imaginative theorist.、Uh, in heterologies, he,、uh, he pointed out that by the 16th century, the signification of barbarian savage as a mechanism, European self-definition reached a high degree of semantic mobility.、Um, I'm going to uh, f- uh, then、um, develop this、uh, further. And he says the discourse on the barbarian signifi- signifies not the reality of which they speak, but the reality from which they did start, which they disguise the place of their enunciation. Again, this term c- pops up. From where? From Benveniste. Incl- Michel de Sarto was also responding to discourse analysis、uh, invented by, not invented, perfected by. Benveniste. So, place of enunciation、uh, is precisely the place that structures the rise of subjectivity. All right. So let's follow this thread of thought and see where it comes. And it 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 is leading us to an analysis of the politics of translation and the politics of language.、Um, now, what what about?、Uh, 18th century、um, conception uh, of barbarian uh, in relation to Chinese.、Um, this is quite relevant. Famous book by Boswell. I don't know how many of you read. Quite fun to read. Life of Johnson. Johnson, as you know, Samuel Johnson was the first、um, British scholar to compile an English dictionary. Right. Boswell was、um, a fan of a lot of famous men, so he would follow them around and would give you interviews. Like today, you know, there are people like that.、Um, they just shadow them. So this is an excerpt. Johnson called the East Indians barbarians. You will accept the Chinese, sir? Boswell asked. 
Johnson said, not so. Boswell, what do you say to the written characters of that language? Johnson, sir, they have not an alphabet. They have not been able to form what all other nations have formed. Boswell, there's more learning in that language than in any other from the immense number of their characters. Johnson, it's only more difficult from its rudeness as there's more labor in hewing down a tree with a stone than with an ax. That's a wonderful conversation there. And uh, of course, uh, Boswell was referring to the Jesuit um, discussions. The Jesuit fathers were the ones who really tried to make a case that Chinese, that there was a possibility of a commensurability between European civilization and uh, Chinese civilization. And they spent many years, starting from, you know, Matteo Ricci, as you know, uh, trying to translate uh, Confucianism, but then they got in trouble <laughs> with the Dominicans and Franciscans and with the Pope, and you know that story. Um, but in any case, so, so this is a sort of a, 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 a typical a, a moment of transition from the earlier Jesuit uh, representation of Chinese civilization to the later, late 18th century uh, discussion. Um, so uh, I'm bringing this up because it's relevant to, uh, to the story I'm going to tell you about the translation. OK. I discussed uh, a treaty uh, as a way of analyzing the politics of tra translation uh, to push further uh, the idea of translingual practice. By the way, when I first brought it up, it was not really, uh, there's a lot of mis misunderstanding, uh, misunderstanding about my position on translingual practice as if it merely it's a question of substituting source language and talking, uh, substituting home language, home language, guest language for source and talking. That's not true. It's not just kind of, there's an analytical method there, including uh, treating translations as a mode of heterolingual address. All right. In the sense, uh, further developing Bevanist concept of mode of address in discursive analysis. And secondly, in the Clash of Empires, tried to, I tried to further develop that via the concept of super sign. I'm going to, uh, as I said, I'm not indulging in the making of a uh, jargon. It's the only way, the super sign is the only way that could get, get me away from the fetishizing of words. Uh, as the really um, a, 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 a problem that we usually encounter in translation studies. Okay, so back to the question, who is the barbarian? Mm. It turns out it had a lot to do with translation. The question that follows from Michel de Soto's uh, discussion is the position a, a, a sensation reversible in that relation we have just looked at? All right. Is it possible for Friday to take Robinson Crusoe as a barbarian? Let's speculate. Is it possible? Is it? <laughs> we don't know. Is it reversible? Because according to Benveni's discussion, you know, um, the taking of this position of enunciation, uh, this I, uh, is reversible in inf inf indefinitely. You know, as as soon as you take up the position. But if you read through um, Volume Two of Robinson Crusoe, which has systematically been excluded from the canon of English literature and the reprinting of Robinson Crusoe, uh, even the end of Volume One, you find out that Friday uh, spends so many years with Robinson Crusoe, but still cannot master English. All right, so. Uh, it's difficult to imagine, uh, but it might. It has the potential for the position of enunciation uh, to be reversed uh, if we follow what discourse analysis does. Right? Okay, so it's a question. It's a question that I raised uh, for uh, our analysis of politics of 
translation. Now, if Brandy, because a number of you say, yes, reversible, for Friday to take Robinson as a barbarian, okay. If so, does the reversal render the figure of the barbarian doubly precarious? Uh, so it's, it's not just a matter of reversal. It's also the mirror of recognition in the Hegelian vein. It, uh, it is a philosophical problem. The, the mirror of recognition is shattered then. Uh, Franz Fanon was preoccupied with this uh, problem. In, especially in his uh, dialogue with Sartre, uh, the mirror of recognition. Imagine the mirror of recognition as a discursive scenario where someone is able to take the position of enunciation and there's the possibility of the other taking over that position, pushing the other, pushing the first speaker to the other position. So for the mode of address to even arise, right? So that mobility. So let's consider this. Uh, in what ways the figure of the barbarian can be rendered doubly precarious uh, in a politics of encounter, right? How can such reversals be prevented or stopped? Oh, okay, that's where the politics of uh, discourse come in. You know, um, it, it's very important for Robinson Crusoe to keep Friday in his place, that is to prevent such reversals from happening. Uh, there are several ways. You use your gun, military action, or legal ban. I'm going to focus on the second one, uh, legal ban. How, how do you enact a ban on a discursive situation where it's, you make it impossible for the other to come and occupy the position of enunciation? So I'm giving you uh, uh, this, uh, these possible scenarios where we can develop a method to analyze the politics of res uh, translation as I presented earlier. Okay, so just to remind you, we're focusing on these, but then uh, I'm going in giving you a, a treaty. By the way, I'm not giving you a case I have some problems with case studies. There is no other case like this. It's simply a historical turning point, right? It's not the case. It's a historical turning point. That was a treaty. Sino-British Treaty of Tianjin signed in 1858. Article 51 says, it is agreed that henceforward the character Yi, notice there are three terms that describe this character. The original Chinese character, right? The pronunciation, pronunciation. Today in Pinyin, you would have spelled it Y I E. Okay, this was the 19th century pronunciation of this character. So first you transcribe the sound, and then you give a translation. So let's take this whole thing as a super sign. It's not one word. So the British says shall not be applied to the government subject of Britannic Majesty in any Chinese official document issued by the Chinese authorities, either in the capital or in the provinces. I don't know if people have encountered such treaties elsewhere. Uh, that is, you outlaw uh, a word, written word, from a foreign language. By the way, this uh, treaty was uh, um, fantastically successful because this word has died. Nobody uses this word anymore. It's dead, killed by the treaty. Um, okay, so, but the treaty says it is agreed. That is, the Qing government also agreed to this interpretation. Well, let's see the article preceding Article 51. Article 50 uh, says, all official communications addressed by the diplomatic consular agents of Her Majesty, the Queen, to the Chinese authorities shall henceforth be written in English. They will, for the present, be accompanied by the Chinese version, but it's understood that in the event of there being any difference of meaning between the English and Chinese text, the British English government will hold the sense as expressed in the English text to be the correct sense. All right, so according to this then, the, uh, the, the treaty that bans 
this character E uh, takes E to mean barbarian. You go to uh, a Chinese dictionary, modern Chinese dictionary, they indeed, indeed uh, gloss this word as barbarian. And you go to uh, historical books written in English and Chinese, they all say Chinese called Europeans barbarians. And this is the inaugural moment. This is where, uh, where the legal ban began to generate an image of this character as barbarian. OK, so you might be curious as to how I know that E does not mean barbarian. Well, you, you, you read the public records, the archives, where this character was intensely debated, disputed among the people who actually uh, struggled over the meaning of, of this character. Okay, everybody fetishized this character. And then they tried to impose meanings on this character. Okay, so you might ask, naturally, what does it mean? Well, there's no easy answer. I'm going to have to take you to, uh, uh, to uh, something else before we get there. Okay. Uh, I wanted you to take that sound character I, E, the Chinese square character, and barbarian together as a super sign, as a legal, and this was, don't ask me what it means now. I wanted to first to uh, state that this super sign was a legal and historical problem of the 19th century. So this is the temporality aspect of, of, the, of, of translation. It was a 19th century problem. We're still living the consequence of it. Right? Secondly, the relationship between the super sign E barbarian, I didn't put the character there, it's just it's a shorthand. And the colonial discourse of barbarian in English and other European languages uh, has to do with the rendering of E as barbarian. Okay, so we are treating um, the situated translation. We are really taking it back to its 19th century, not context. Um, I don't want to use context. It was in text. It, it was textual. It was a text that produces the context, by the way. All right, it was this legal text that produces many contexts in the future. So let's think about the temporalities back and forth like this, right? So I want us to take this whole thing as a super sign. Um, you would not be able to understand the historicity of it by just taking the character E and ask, what does it mean? It simply doesn't work. Um, I'm just offering a method for analyzing the politics of translation. So let's think of it as a totality, as opposed to simply the character itself, which could be misleading, which would then lead us astray into etymological exercises, which would not necessarily be historical. All right, okay, so, Basically, I'm suggesting there is the birth of the super sign here. We treat it not as a word, but as a super sign. What is a super sign? So, super signs are not words, but heterocultural signifying or heterolingual signifying chain that crisscrosses the semantic fields of two or several languages simultaneously. Um, they make, sorry, there's a typo, make an impact on the meaning of recognizable verbal units. So when pe people make uh, a dictionary, uh, such as a cihai in, ch in, in China, they would then just take a single word, not recognizing there's a signifying chain behind it that comes already with the English signification. The signifier, signifier is uh, e. The signified is English, right? So how do you analyze something like this? The super sign lies behind the wordness of a concept. See, we're distinguishing between word and concept. And articulates the latter without itself being articulated in reified forms. That's the reason that I argue that we should move away from the fetishized word. 
because we wouldn't get anywhere just by analyzing the square character. All right. So then the heterolingual uh, super sign does not fit into the familiar descriptions of verbal phenomenon and almost always eludes normative etymological analysis because it never announces its positivity in terms of discrete word unit. In short, the super sign is not a word, but a fantastic crossbreed of co translated concepts in the uh, form of a word one that we can demonstrate with a series of verbal signs connected by slashes. I invented it so that we could, oh, you can invent some other signs simply as long as we join them together. We don't take them as self-evident mutual translations. Yeah? OK. Uh, then the super sign emerges out of the interstices of existing language across the abyss of phonetic ideographic differences as a heterolingual signifying chain, it always requires more than one linguistic system to complete the process of signification, as is dem demonstrated by that treaty, the British Chinese Treaty from 1858. Right? The supersai can thus be figured as a manner of metonymical thinking, thinking by association that induces, compels, and orders the migration and dispersion of prior signs across different languages and different semiotic media. Doesn't have to be. Uh, so basically, this analysis can take us out of the self-evidence of the meaning of any concept uh, or word. Right? So that's why I, I, I had to invent this concept. Uh, otherwise, I would be repeating in circular manner what E means. Right? Okay, uh, how did it get there? How, why did the British impose a treaty ban on the world? It started with the barbarian eye incident, quite hilarious, in 1834, right? Quite a few years before the first Opium War, Lord Napier, the, the first British official, a government official to be sent to China after the charter of the East Indian Company was lifted, was suspended by the government, by those country traders, traders. He was named the chief superintendent of British trade. He didn't announce himself, introduce himself properly to the local uh, uh, vice, viceroy. Um, uh, and then um, he was told, I'm really abbreviating this story, he was told by his translator, most probably uh, Karl Grislak, uh, that his official title, the Chief Superintendent of British Trade, was translated in Chinese documents as Yi Mu. Oops. Uh, Yi Mu. Which then was rendered by a, uh, a newspaper, an English language news newspaper published in Canton or Guangzhou as the barbarian eye. And then uh, Lord Napier took it as an insult. So it was a deliberate translation um, uh, to cre create a moment of crisis. Um, and I call this translation catacrisis. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a wrong translation. I'm only going to say it's a political rendering of a situation pushing the relationship between the two countries to crisis. Okay. The British Indian Company conducted trade with China for more than a century. The English factory was established in Guangzhou in 1800. And uh, there were no such crisis, moments of crisis, until then. And the real problem was the smuggling of opium to China then, all right? And uh, so uh, Lu Kun was the viceroy uh, managing the, the affairs, foreign affairs there. And then in the Chinese repository, there was re uh, a report saying that Lu Kun uh, called Lord Napier the uh, barbarian eye. And this story proliferated. Even in the 90s, there was a new book called The Barbarian Eye, the title, <laughs> to, to 
uh, reiterate the story of Chinese calling the British barbarians. See the reversal of the position of enunciation? It was not uh, proposed by the Qing government. It was proposed by the British themselves. Strangely, so the doubling of this precarious figure of the barbarian in English, evoking an English translation of Chinese is a very complicated situation there. Okay, Lord Napier's the declaration of war. The first battle, uh, a military encounter with the Qing Navy was not in the Opium War, the first Opium War, 1839. It was actually 1834, and it was inaugurated by precisely this kind of communication, so-called uh, catacrisis. He says, His Majesty, the King of England, is the, a great and powerful monarch that he rules over an extent of territory in the four corners of the world, more comprehensive in space, and infinitely more so in power than the whole empire of China that he commands armies of bold and fierce soldiers who have conquered wherever they went, and that he's possessed of great ships of war carrying even as many as 120 guns which pass quietly along the seas where no, deep, no native China has ever dared to show his face. I mean, this is such a, an amazing announcement of the power of the British Empire. And it's used, the story goes that the Qing government had no idea what it was which is not true, and they had intelligence. That's why they wanted to keep the British out. In the Ming Dynasty, by the way, since uh, our last uh, uh, talk was about the British, about the Portuguese, um, so I, I hope you, we, we remember, which is often not remembered, that in the 16th century, the Portuguese started a military conflict with the Ming Dynasty, and they were defeated, that's why there were negotiations that they should go to Macau. All right, there were two military uh, encounters whereby the Portuguese uh, were defeated. But this, several centuries later, this was a different situation. The, the, the British Empire was much, so much more stronger than the Portuguese Empire back then. Okay, so the invention of the super sign started uh, with uh, uh, certain maneuvers. And this super sign basically draws an equal sign between E and barbarian. So this is what it succeeds in doing. Remember my first lecture about the logic of equivalence. Now I'm getting into the politics of it. It also simultaneously means that E does not mean foreigner, which was the earlier translation done by the East Indian Company. And it was in this translation, E equals foreigner was in the first ever English Chinese dictionary compiled by missionary Do Mor uh, Robert Morrison, British uh, in, uh, missionary Robert Morrison, published in 1850. And he was uh, an interpreter for the East Indian Company. Um, but this E equals foreigner was sub suddenly changed, uh, resignified by barbarian on the eaves of the Opium War, okay? But then there's another twist to it. I have an analysis in chapter three of the clash of empires that E used to mean Tuluki Ayman. Uh, Tuluki Ayman was the Manchu uh, glossing of the meaning of the Chinese character accepted by the imperial power, as you know, uh, starting from 16. 44, China was conquered by the Manchus from the north, northern tribes. So they were considered as foreigners ruling China for centuries. So the British didn't really encounter another foreign ruler in China when they uh, uh, arrived there. And also the Portuguese also encountered a foreign ruler, that's the Manchus. And they themselves had to negotiate what he meant and then they decided Tulugi Ayman was the proper Manchu translation of this Chinese character. And then there, there were extensive discussions in the 18th century um, um, on, this, on this concept, all right? So the, the Manchu chain decided to uh, gloss this meaning as someone born uh, outside. 
because they had to justify their rule of China in terms of, of their own uh, legitimacy. Uh, and so the way they justified it, Manchu emperors would say repeatedly that you rule by virtue, not by identity. Even though we come from the outside China, we are the virtuous emperors. And this is the doctrine, this is the Confucian doctrine that the ruler must be virtuous. So by your own doctrine, we are legitim legitimate rulers of you. So that was the Manchu argument throughout um, the 18th century. And there was a lot of new cl classical Confucian studies de dedicated to this problem that to legitimize the Qing rulers, the Manchus, outsiders, foreigners who came to China to rule the population and who also massacred people, right? The Jiangnan massacre. Chinese men who refused to wear the queue the foreign sign of loyalty to the new ruler would be executed, beheaded. And so in the 17th century, um, you would have horrors episodes about uh, Chinese men, intellectuals, who defy this, uh, this head code imposed by the Manchus. That is, you shave the front and you, 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 you raise, you have a little cue outside. So men who defy that hair code in 1645 were executed. So there are records of people in fact say, I would rather lose my head than obey the, the head code, right? So this is very, very well known. So we are dealing with two foreign, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't call them colonial, but in the previous that was more complicated, two imperial and ambitious imperial forces there contending with each other over China, right? So there's more behind this character. Okay, so which one would you go for? To Lurky Ayman, foreigner, or barbarian? So the very answer one uh, provides to that question is the side of politics, right? And politics that uh, had taken place over the centuries. Um, the factory records of the British East and Indian Company uh, uh, glossed, I looked through the records, mostly commercial transactions. And they would also translate decrees from the emperor concerning foreign trade. And this word was consistently rendered as foreigner by the British themselves for over a century, 100 years, since 1800, all right? Robert Morrison was the uh, missionary I mentioned, and he also served the East Indian Company. Uh, Dictionary of the Chinese Language, uh, 1815, and it, he spent many years, you know, continued to publish multi volumes until 1820. And this is the literal quote from his dictionary Fan Ren, okay, the, the, this now would be R E N in Pinyin, or Yi Ren, a foreigner. The latter, this one, is the more respectable term. The same may be expressed by Yuan Ren, a distant man, one from remote parts. Okay, so this was the authoritative dictionary compiled by the British, by um, Robert Morrison, and was used for a hundred years until the eve of the Opium War. So, is this more correct? Well, uh, this was not so, not more correct, but more consistent with the Manchu interpretation, Ayman, uh, Tulogi Ayman, foreign, from a distance, uh, someone from outside. But doesn't mean that you cannot rule the people. If you are virtuous, you can rule the people. So that's the imperial interpretation that is totally consistent with the Manchu classical uh, glossing of the character, all right? Now, uh, then the question is, why did they change the readings? <laughs> uh, this hydro-linguistic figuring of the barbarian, this dangerous moment of reversal that the British uh, got really angry about I, I remember on Monday, Vince asked, what's the effect of it? This, if you read the, um, 
the British Imperial Archives, it's full of affect. They're really angry. It's not that they were, uh, you know, uh, placing a ruse there. No, they were really angry. They were offended by the translation. They said, you call us a barbarian. But then remember, uh, Dr. Johnson already called the Chinese barbarians. You can't be barbarians at the same time. And like Friday calling, uh, 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 not exactly in explicit terms in language, uh, addressing uh, Robin Crusoe as barbarian. You can't do it simultaneously. You could do it perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, from one moment to the, there's a temporality going on. You can't do it simultaneously, which would be such a travesty of logic. See? Okay. So then there's all kinds of speculations to invent a pretext for opium war, to assert the imperial will, and I would rather uh, do endorse the last one, to fight the specter of uncertainty surrounding the precarious figure of barbarian in the imperial uh, expansion into Asia, uh, especially into China itself. So, you see, it's not easy to read something like Yi. <laughs> You really need a method. Um, took me a long time to develop this translation as a hydrolingual or hydrolinguistic mode of address um, to invent a super sign like this chain. Yeah? And it says something about the political unconscious imperial design, both on the side of British and on the side of the Manchus, with respect to this territory that they wanted to conquer, or they have already conquered. And in the process of doing so, there is a, this monstrous doubling of the barbarian and the sovereign subject. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm sure you have lots of questions about this. Thank you very much.